Hey, we're beginning a new series today called Love Rules. It'll be a four-week series. It's going to be very helpful. In fact, I, Jeff and I both think this is going to be one of the great series that we've ever enjoyed as a church. And I want to begin with a verse that's going to be the foundation. And I want you to know today is all about a foundation. If you get today, the next week is going to be very eye-opening to you. It's going to be one of those transformational things I think all of you are going to re- really be blessed by. But it all hinges on getting today. And so I want to start with a verse. It's in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. It's a small little verse, and I want you to read it with me in full voice, all right? Whoever does not love does not know God. Or let's try that again in full voice. Everybody read it with me. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Let's try that one more time, and let's really nail that last part of the verse, all right? Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Would you bow your heads and pray with me, please? Father in heaven, thank you for that verse, the depth of that verse. May today, in a supernatural way, we get just a glimpse of what that verse entails. And for that person who has never felt love, may they supernaturally experience divine love today in a way that they've never known possible. And for people who are all blocked in their minds because they've never had that flood of your love wash over them, may today that be their experience. And we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. I suspect that there are some in the auditorium when we read a verse like that who automatically say, okay, God's love, got that. Check that off the list. I could have stayed home and watched more political stuff on TV or I could have done something else. I've got the whole God is love thing. We'd think we understand that. And yet it's a great paradox. For if you think you understand the verse God is love, let me assure you, you don't have a clue what that verse means. You really don't have a clue. God's love is exactly what we need to talk about today as the foundation of this series, Love Rules. But more than that, it is the foundation for everything we need to talk about for you to have a healthy, good life. It is very, very, very important. When it comes to understanding God's love, I don't think any of us, however profound you might be, I don't think any of us have much more than maybe just a kindergarten understanding of what it really means. I think maybe we have had momentary glimpses, but we have never come close to getting anywhere near the magnitude of God's love. When it comes to understanding God's love, I think we're all pretty much in the position of a five-year-old who just learned that one plus one equals two. That's a great thing to know, but if we tried to say, how would that five-year-old understand, let's say Einstein's theory of relativity, we'd say, oh, we get it. That's a big gap. That's the gap I'm talking about when I say our understanding of God's love and the true magnitude of God's love. I believe we experience God's love the way an ant at the foot of Mount Everest might experience the magnificence of that mountain. The ant really doesn't have a clue, does it? It just can't have a clue. And that's kind of where we are with God's love. We touch a small part of God's love, but we don't at all grasp the grandeur, the majesty, the totality of what God's love really, really means. Our understanding of God's love is a bit like the understanding of a microorganism floating out in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico might have about what the ocean is all about. The depth of the ocean, the breadth of the ocean. A microorganism would not be able to understand any of that. And that's pretty much where we're at when it comes to understanding God's love. We don't have a clue. And if we have a clue, it's that we don't have a clue. And that's the beginnings of really understanding or beginning to understand God's love. Over the years, I've become convinced that God loves me. I didn't always feel that. I was a pastor for many, many years when deep down, I didn't really understand God's true love for me. I thought it was based on my performance. If I could only perform good enough, if I could only hit it out of the park when I was preaching, if I could only get enough people to give their lives to Jesus, if I could only live up to this moral expectation, if I could only do those things, then God likes me, he loves me, everything is great. But as soon as I didn't live up to those things, I had such guilt and such shame and such a sense that God didn't love me. And here I was a pastor, I'd missed it a million times. 
The most profound your experience is of God's love, the more you realize you're just scratching the surface. When you finally begin to understand it, you realize you're just scratching the surface. Have you ever laid out on a starry night and looked up at the stars and just in that moment realized that the stars you are seeing is just, are just the beginnings of what actually is up there? That what you're seeing millions and millions and millions of miles away just points to something that is beyond anything, that the, the infinitude of that is overwhelming to you and you realize, my soul, there are billions and billions of stars and billions and billions and miles of space forever it seems to go in every direction. And you look at the stars and you say, oh my, I just have just a, just a teeny tiny idea of what it's all about. That's what God's love is all about. That's how experiencing his love is. If it's an authentic experience, it never gets to the point where you say, I've been there, done that, check it off the list. No, when you have an authentic experience with God's love, it changes you. It makes everything different. It gives you a whole new perspective on life. It points beyond itself to something grander than you could ever imagine. There's another verse I want us to hang our hats on today. It's in Ephesians chapter 3. We've read it before, but I want us to read it again. Ephesians 3, verse 17, 18, and 19 on the screen. Read like this, and I pray, Paul is writing, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. I want to point out a couple of things about this verse. First of all, Paul prays that you would have supernatural power. Did you see that? Uh, right at the beginning, verse 17, I pray that you may have, that you may being rooted and established in love, verse 18, may have power to grasp this great love. You need power to grasp this great love. What he's saying is this, it takes spiritual power to even begin to understand the height, depth, width, and length of God's love. Our natural mind, and when I say natural mind, I mean our mind not yet spiritually awakened, will always hear this message and you'll always say something like this, yeah, that's too good to be true. That's too good to be true. He's, he, he must only be telling us half of the story. He's got to be leaving some stuff out because there is nothing that great. There's nothing that marvelous. There's nothing that is that powerful. And so Paul is saying, I pray that you'll have the power, the supernatural power to be able to get this. Because when you do, it changes everything. It's a God thing for us to be able to grasp it. Look at verse 19, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. He prays that we would have the power, that supernatural power, to know that which is beyond knowledge, to know the love of Christ that is beyond our comprehension to even begin to understand. Now question, how do you know something when it's unknowable? The answer is when you realize that you can't know it. That's the beginnings of you kind of sort of knowing it, when you realize you can't know it. When you realize you don't have a clue, then you're starting to get a clue. That's what God's love is like. Paul wants us to have the spiritual insight to grasp what is unknowable about God's love, to grasp how wide, how long, how high and deep it is. You begin to know the width of Christ's love when you begin to realize that it goes from infinity to the east to infinity to the west. So that if you were to travel a trillion miles in that direction and then travel a trillion miles in that direction, you haven't even really gone one inch in terms of comprehending the length of God's love. Think about that. You begin to understand how long the length of Christ's love is when you begin to understand that it goes from infinity in front of you to infinity behind you. Trillion miles, go a trillion miles that way. Go a trillion miles that way. And you haven't even gone one inch in understanding what God's love is really like. You wanna know the height of Christ's love? Take a rocket ship straight up trillions of miles up, even a trillion miles up, you haven't even knocked off one inch of what God's love is like. 
or the depth of Christ's love. Go a trillion, trillion, trillion to the trillionth light years down as far as you can go. Keep going farther and farther and farther. You have not even traveled one inch as it relates to the depths of God's love. It is amazing. However low you go, God's love is lower. However high you go, God's love is higher. However wide you go, God's love is wider. However long you go, God's love is longer. Not just that, but he is infinity longer and infinity higher and infinity wider and infinity deeper. And when you grasp that, you're just beginning to get a clue that you will never, ever, ever be able to grasp the magnitude of God's love. God's love, when you begin to see that you can't possibly outrun it, you can't outjump it, you can't outfall it, you can't outlast it, and you can't outsin it, it is greater than all of those things, you'll just begin to have a clue about how little you know about God's love. That's why it's going to be important for you to be here in this series. It's going to be important for you to understand this foundational truth because this is not something that is taught in every church. Sadly, it's not taught in most churches. The foundation of who God is, the essence of who he is, is love. And it's pivotally important to all that we do. When you begin to see that, you can't comprehend it, you can't grasp it, you can't limit it, you can't qualify it. It begins to shift things in you and it begins to change you. You'll see God's love, the most powerful force in the world. When we bump up against it and our un- unenlightened mind suddenly is enlightened, we begin to see everything, including ourselves, differently. And that's what it's all about, to be able to see things differently. Now this morning we want to break down those walls that are preventing you from beginning to see this. And I think words are powerful and so I'm going to ask you to just repeat after me kind of a prayer. I'm going to say a sentence and I want you to say a sentence. And I want this to kind of be your declaration that you want to begin to grasp the magnitude of God's love. All right? So you did great in full voice a minute ago. I'll give you a sentence at a time. In full voice I want us to declare this to the Lord. Okay? God, we don't have a clue. We don't get it. We are so small in our thinking. And your love is like an infinite ocean. Father, empower us to know the height and the depth and the width and the length of the love of Christ that passes all knowledge. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, before I get into kind of more of what I wanted to talk about, there's one little thing I want to get into, which is the way we understand God. And I think this will be helpful. It's very helpful to me. I hope it'll be helpful to you. You may want to take a couple of little notes on this. Um, God is presented in different ways in the Bible. There are different ways he's presented. And I think the composite of all of it helps us. But the first way is something that theologians call is as a super being. If you want to write that down, that's something just hang on to, super being. This will be real quick, real easy to understand. In other words, when you read some of the biblical accounts about God, he seems to be just a bigger version of a human. Like he's got big muscles. Um, When when we describe God as father, um, I don't think he has genitalia, quite frankly. I don't think that he is a man in that sense, but that's the language that's used. The picture that we have is just God as a bigger version of us. Uh, That was very uh, common in the ancient world. The the Greeks, uh, Greek mythology, Roman mythology, uh, they describe their gods that way and uh, as as just bigger versions of humans. And there is an element of that in in the way the first people began to describe God in in the Hebrew scriptures, he had those human characteristics. It was an easy thing for people to understand. We understand that. It's important for us to understand that. The next way that we understand God is as hyper being, not super being, but hyper being. And by that, I mean, he goes beyond just a human understanding. We can't just make him a glorified human. We say, you know, there, there's things about him that are so big, it goes beyond human. We have to describe him with metaphors. We have to say things like, he's like a rock, or he's like water, or he's like a mother hen gathering her chicks, or he is like a cypress tree, or he is like an eagle. 
Uh, that's, that's one step beyond just seeing him as a glorified human and saying, no, yeah, no, it's bigger than that. These metaphors are helpful to see him in even a bigger way. But then there's a third way, and this way really wasn't talked about much until the last century. And there was a Lutheran theologian and an existentialist philosopher who's a brilliant guy, did a lot to shape our understanding of, of, of the scriptures. His name was Paul Tillich. And Paul Tillich described God God as ground of being. You may want to write that down, ground of being. In other words, he said, it's okay to see God as a bigger than human version of, of deity. It's okay to say, no, it's, it's even bigger than that. It's, wow, when I describe him, I've got to use words that are even outside of human categories because he's that big. He said, no, it's, it's even beyond that. It is realizing, oh, he is the ground. I'm thinking I can describe God, and He is the ground of being. He is every step I'm taking, it is in Him. He is this river that I live in. He is this space that I occupy. He is more than just a, a, a statue of a, of a muscle man. He's more than that. He's more than a white bearded old person on a throne. He's more than that. He is this river that we're grounded in, that we flow in, everything about him. And Tillich said that the essence of God is two things. He is spirit and he's love. So everything about us operates in God's love. Our very creation was his love. Now, we don't always see it. The problems in the world are we, we, we have blinders on. We have been twisted and distorted in our thinking. And it's a process to get to that place where the blinders can be taken off. And you begin to see, wow, his love is everywhere. And it can flow in me. It can flow in you. And I can see situations that I used to see one way and I can see it another way as God's love makes a difference. Paul says in Ephesians 3, 17, the verse we read a moment ago, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love. What he's saying is that you will understand you are rooted in this love. This love is what you walk in. This love is what you live in. God's love is everything. It's not a little deal. It's everything. Which leads me to the second thing I want to say, which is this. As the truth God is love becomes more real to me, I begin to have a sense of well-being and a sense of contentment. Regardless of what happens around me, my life is different because of God's love. Now listen, again, I was a pastor for a long time, been a pastor my whole life. And many, many, many years, I was up and down all over the place depending on which way the wind blew. But as I have begun to sense God's love, I'm discovering I'm able to be content wherever I am because I'm always right in the center of God's love. And that's a beautiful place to be. I wish that I did it right always. I wish I opened up correctly always. Sometimes the old thinking kind of clouds me for a minute, but, but for much of my days now, it's different. I'm surrounded by the love of God. To the extent that I'm surrounded by God's love and I understand that, I don't have to build my life on having a great reputation, making people think that I'm some big body. That used to be a big deal to me. I want everybody to think I was some big body. Or, or, or how I look, or the shape that I'm in, or the bank account that I have, all those things that have at times been important to me, all of those things begin to change, and I realize, oh, I am learning to root my life in God's love, which never fails, never fails. The whole point of the next few weeks is gonna be to wake up to that. To do that, we're gonna have to confront obstacles that are in our minds that prevent us from fully grasping God's love. One of the major obstacles we have in our head that keeps us from really being transformed, and I want you to get this, because some of you, this is gonna be it for you, this will be the point. One of the things that blocks us is 
our understanding of what love is. We're so screwed up and polluted in our minds by what love means. It can happen a million different ways. For example, your dad says he loves you over and over again. I love you, I love you, I love you, but he's never around. He, there's never any bonding with him. There's actually detachment for him from him. Or your parents say, I love you, I love you, I love you, but by the third grade, it becomes real clear that their love seems to go up or down based on how you did in Little League, or what score you made in school, or how good you played that musical instrument. The love you experience from them is totally conditional. If you act a certain way, they love you. If you don't act a certain way, they don't love you. Or it could be worse than that. Somebody in your life could be saying to you, I love you all the time. And then they beat you because you did something wrong. Or maybe they sexually abused you all the while saying, I love you. I love you. And so we grow up thinking that love looks like that. Love gets associated with detachment or with performance or with abuse. And then you're told by a preacher, God is love. Well, that's not necessarily good news if your idea of love is all screwed up. And then we impose our polluted views of love onto God, and that isn't very appealing. I remember pastoring my second church in Louisiana, and a lady began coming to our church, and she has a one-year-old little girl, and she'd bring the baby. She came Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, which is the way we used to do it in the old days. I didn't know her well, but she seemed like a nice lady. But one day my secretary said to me, have I, have I ever noticed the amount of bruises on this lady? And I said, no, and I, I don't know, I don't, I'm not real observant on stuff like that. I said, no, I didn't notice that. And so she began to explore a little bit and always she'd get the same answer, oh, I fell down or I got my arm caught in the door or I bumped my head. And I'm thinking, wow, this, this is a clumsy, I wasn't super bright, I think this is a clumsy lady, I guess. But over time I began to suspect this wasn't all that was going on. And so one day I talked to her and she said, no, it's nothing. It's just, I said, are you sure? And she said, that's your promise. It's nothing. And then a few weeks later, she came and she had a tooth gone. I said, talk to me. And she said her boyfriend, when he drank, he would punch her. And so I talked to her about getting out, even got her in a little halfway shelter that helped battered and abused women. And she stayed a few weeks, and then she went right back, came to church, everything's good, wonderful. Then it all started again. I remember asking her, what are you thinking? You got a one-year-old daughter. What are, you, what are you think? Help me understand, what are you thinking? And she said, but he loves me. He loves me. He always tells me he's sorry. Somehow in her twisted understanding, Love did not rule out abuse. She had learned that somewhere. And now her daughter was learning that somewhere. It's tragic if that's your view of love. You hear God is love and you think, maybe he'll abuse me. In fact, I'm convinced that a lot of traditional theology flows out of people who have jaded views of love and they then impose those views upon God. Let me say that again because I want you to hear me. I'm convinced that a lot of traditional theology flows out of people who have jaded views of love and they then impose that on God. So when they say God is love, it doesn't rule out a whole lot of terrible stuff. So you've got a lot of twisted theology in the church and all of it's supposed to be a part of God's love. I read a great book years ago, I would encourage you to read it, it's called The Misunderstood God, The Lies Religion Tells About God, it's written by Darren Hufford, great book if you want to read it. He says this, could you imagine me holding my nine month old son Jude in my arms and telling him that under no circumstance would I share my glory with him, it is all mine. What if I lovingly told him that if he disobeyed me again and again, I would pour gasoline on him and light him on fire? What kind of father would I be if I explained to him that he needed to give me 10% of everything he had or I would withdraw my hand of protection from his life and I would allow the fires of hell to swallow him? What if I told one of my daughters that she was put here on earth to just be my slave, my servant? 
Could you picture me telling my children that I've written everything about me down in a book and unless they read it every day of their lives, they won't know me and the most important thing is to know me and if they don't, they're gonna be in hell forever. What parent would purposely inject their child with a terrible disease as a punishment for disobedience? Would any of you do that? No. What father would turn his head away from his son or daughter the moment the child made a mistake? Any parent who acted like this, we would think is a poor parent. In fact, we would go further. We would say they're a criminal parent. We would say a deranged parent, and yet you find just this sort of thing being ascribed to God. God is love, but he also does these things. In fact, in some theologies, it's even worse than this. In some theologies, God not only pours gasoline on you and sets you on fire, but he keeps you in flames forever and ever 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 and ever. That's what I heard. And in some theologies, it even gets worse than that because in these theologies, God predestined that they w- this would happen to you. So he created you for the purpose of setting you on fire eternally, forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. You say, are there churches that believe that? Thousands, thousands. Now I'm just saying there is a disconnect when you say God is love and the beauty of what that means. And then you say, But if you step on a crack, you're through, buddy. You don't pray it right. You don't give your tithe. You you don't pray a certain way. What kind of sick God is that? You see, when you have these different understandings, you've got to say, somebody's got to help us understand the scripture. That's why we go to Jesus and we say, Jesus is the eyes we're going to look through to understand scripture. And Jesus said, as he was being nailed to a cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing, which is in perfect context of what God is like. He is a God of love, a God of love. Second thing we do is we get messed up because we don't understand what love actually means, the true depths of the word love to describe God. We think love means like we use love. When I say I love my wife, that means something. Or I say I love the Falcons, they're about to start coming on TV, that that means something. Or I love Popeye's fried chicken, which I do love Popeye's fried chicken. That means something. But it's a totally different word you understand. When I say I love Jane, I love her differently than I love the Falcons. The Falcons lose three games in a row, I'm out, I'm done. I don't even watch them, <laughs> I'm over. But Jane have two or three bad days, we're good, we're fine, we can make, we'll make it. We'll make it because I love her differently than I love the Falcons. The word used to describe God as love is this word agape. Many of you know this word, but I want you to see the definition. It, it means others oriented. It means self-sacrificial. It means choice-based. In other words, the choice has been made that love is going to be there. It's not something that has to be, it's not dependent upon the other person doing anything to earn it or deserve it. That's the big thing that the true Christian church understands. It is not earned or deserved. It is only out of God's goodness it is given to us. And it's ascribing worth to another at a cost to oneself. That's what it means when it says God is love. Agape love is based on choice. It's not based on something you find in the other person. It's based on the decision you make. It's not based on any kind of feeling. It's just based on God is love. Which brings us back to the verse we started with, 1 John 4, 8, God is love. God is agape. It doesn't say that God just loves as a verb. It says God is love. He is that ground of being. It is love that we operate in. It is love that we live in us every single day, not just God looking down at us, wishing on us love or giving us love. It is everything he is. God is love. It's a noun. God is love. God's love isn't just something it, it, he does. It's who he is. God loves you because he is love. He loves you because he is love. It's impossible for God to turn that off. For God to be able to turn that off means he wouldn't be God. All God is is love. That's who he is. And if he stopped loving you, he wouldn't be God. It's important to know that. To not grasp this means you'll be in continual bondage in your mind. True freedom happens in me when I let the love of God flow in my heart and flow in my mind. That unlocks my mind in ways I never knew possible. This whole universe takes on a different dimension. 
God's love, agape, others-oriented, self-sacrificial, choice-based, ascribing worth to another is at a cost to oneself. When I get that, my mind is open. I'm free. I'm free. There's nothing you could possibly do more to get God to love you. He loves you. So I just want you to think about that for a minute. He loves you. As messed up as you maybe have ever been, he loves you. The mistakes you've ever made, he loves you. Nothing changes. You can't be better and get more love tomorrow. You can't. He loves you perfectly. I remember when that became a, a, a revelation to me. It's like, why didn't I get that for all of those years? He loves us. And I want to close with a psalm that to me is one of the greatest psalms. We've just been talking about psalms through the summer. But this psalm out of the message is so good, and I want you to get it. It's Psalm 118, and in the message it says this. Thank God because he's good, because his love never quits. Tell the world, Israel, his love never quits. And you, clan of Aaron, tell the world, his love never quits. And you who fear God, join in, his love never quits. Blessed are you who enter in God's name from God's house. We bless you. God is God. He has bathed us in light. Festoon the shrine with garlands, hang colored banners above the altar. You're my God and I thank you. Oh my God, I lift high your praise. Thank God he's so good. His love never quits. Say that sentence with me. His love never quits. Would you bow your heads please? Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the truth that you are love. You are love, not just part love. You are all love. Help us learn what that is. Help us see how that relates to our own lives, how it affects everything in us, how it affects how we think of ourselves, how we think of our friends around us in our church, how we think about people around us in our, in our community and world. Help us get our arms around you are love. And may that be a driving force to help us become the people you created us to be. God, we love you. We pray this in Christ's name.